As uh, Dr. Parmentella mentioned, I've retired from uh, NIST and I'm now a senior fellow at the Krasnow Institute uh, for Advanced Studies at George Mason. I've got a NIST logo up here and ARL because uh, most of this work was done at NIST uh, under sponsorship for ARL. Uh, it's a three-part sermon, um, current state of the art, near-term prospects, and long-term potential. The current state of the art, uh, I think is, uh, at least in the Army, uh, future combat system is represented by the uh, 40 RCS reference model architecture, which is a hierarchical structure of uh, goals and commands, uh, very similar to the Army uh, uh, command and control structure. This is a vehicle that's operating under that um, control system. Uh, this is a striker vehicle that uh, uh, I believe this has conducted uh, some of the TRL-6 exercises at uh, Fort Bliss. Uh, 40 RCS has a, a major uh, uh, emphasis on rep representing the world model at many uh, levels, planning and uh, uh, replanning and reacting at many levels, and integration of uh, many different kinds of sensors developed by NIST for ARL uh, and adopted by GDRS for future combat systems. Basic uh, intelligence system uh, consists of a world model uh, that supports behavior and perception, allows you to decompose goals into actions that act on the real world and you sense those. Um, Perception uh, establishes a correspondence between the uh, internal and external world and uh, behavior then uses that uh, world model to generate uh, appropriate action to achieve the goals. There's an OODA loop uh, from perception uh, to behavior, uh, which is familiar to people in the, in the military. Uh, this is the 40 RCS reference model. You see here a vehicle in some sort of a command and control structure. Uh, and the vehicle consists of locomotion, which is basically the driving function, uh, mission package, which may be a weapon system, uh, communications uh, package, and a uh, um, attention package, which could be a RISTA, uh, RISTA that basically looks out in the distance. Uh, each node in this uh, command and control structure is an OODA loop. So OODA loops are closed at uh, various levels at various uh, frequencies. If we look at uh, one of these nodes, uh, it uh, has this sort of characteristic. Blowing it up here a little bit, behavior generation, which takes uh, command commands with goals uh, and communicates with its supervisor as to what its status is. World modeling, which supports a knowledge database. Sensory processing, which keeps that, uh, that database up to up to uh, uh, current, a value judgment system which decides what's good and bad, what's uh, risky and what's uh, safe, uh, how aggressive the uh, vehicle wants to be, uh, and uh, what's attractive and what's uh, repulsive. Has an operator interface that allows the operator to look in any of these uh, modules to see what the, the robot is perceiving, what it's thinking, what it's planning, and what it's doing at any a particular time. That's extremely important for uh, software debugging. Near-term prospects, uh, this methodology uh, promises the ability for manned and unmanned collaboration to, uh, to perform uh, tactical behaviors uh, in uh, groups of single vehicles, section level, platoon level, or company level. This is an example scenario of a section uh, of a scout platoon with three uh, manned vehicles, an unmanned ground vehicle, and an unground, unmanned area vehicle which is uh, doing a route reconnaissance on this road. Uh, they encounter a water hazard and a bridge, report that to the section commander who then deploys the UAV to search for a route around the uh, water hazard uh, and look for enemy activity on the other side. Uh, once that uh, route is found, or potential route is found, the UGV uh, is sent out to actually explore that route and establish a overwatch position on the far side of the hazard. Uh, and the UAV then goes uh, on the next, uh, beyond the next uh, uh, terrain feature, while the manned vehicles then move forward to uh, uh, inspect the bridge and uh, uh, characterize the water hazard. There's a software methodology that's been developed to uh, um, build 
intelligent systems using this methodology. It's a six-step uh, process, which I'll uh, blow it up here a little bit to see the, the various steps. First step is to read all the uh, Army field manuals uh, and uh, any driving uh, manuals uh, and, and converse with domain experts. It's basically a, a data mining to uh, figure out what is the TASTI composition, ta create a TASTI composition tree at various levels, then um, create a task vocabulary for each echelon in this uh, control architecture, map that onto a hierarchy of agents within uh, um, organizational units. Um, here's basically the organizational units for uh, for a single vehicle within a uh, section within a scout platoon. Then uh, figure out what are the uh, state graphs that allows you to uh, conduct uh, particular operations uh, for each of the possible situations that the vehicle uh, might find itself in. Condition action rules for each state. Then figure out what are the uh, triggering conditions, the antecedent world states that uh, cause uh, the state graph to trigger from one uh, place to another, identify the objects that make up those uh, antecedent world states, and then determine the sensor requirements to actually perceive uh, and the resolution required to actually perceive those objects. Now, that's a tedious process. Uh, there's many tasks in the command vo uh, vocabulary at every level, many parameters for each task. Um, many objects that got to be recognized in many situations to be understood, but the numbers are not infinite. Uh, they are, in fact, uh, quite modest, at least from a computer science standpoint, which is one of the advantages of hierarchies and, and state graphs. For example, we did uh, for ARL and for DARPA a uh, study of autonomous on-road driving, and our estimates are it takes about 200 tasks about 100 parameters, about 1,000 uh, transition conditions, and about 10,000 objects or events that need to be uh, recognized. Other skills uh, uh, may require similar numbers, but uh, those are not infinite uh, numbers. For a uh, computer, uh, 10,000 things is not a, not a big deal. Current and near-term cognitive reasoning capabilities, planning and control uh, will uh, ec uh, enable tactical, uh, useful tactical uh, behaviors on the battlefield, I believe, within a decade. Uh, but the re remaining tall pole in the tent is perception. Um, intelligent machines cannot uh, achieve human levels of performance until they can uh, perform as well as humans on visual tasks. Now, the sensor technology is well developed. Uh, we've got sensors that can see better than humans, the color, of the clear, night vision, LADAR, stereo. Um, what's lacking is the ability to perceive and understand situations and relationships. Uh, machine vision is far inferior to uh, human capabilities in scene understanding and situation assessment. Long-term potential, I believe, and some, uh, a lot of people are beginning to think that a solution may be in reverse engineering of the, the brain. Uh, this is recently cited as a grand challenge by the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, there's a group uh, that I've been associated with at uh, Krasnow working on a decade of the mind. The fourth conference is being held at uh, Sandia National Labs on reverse engineering of the brain. And recent progress in neuroscience and intelligence systems engineering uh, makes this a pro promising approach. Brain imaging is revealing many of the uh, functional um, operations in the brain. Uh, neuromodeling is many, uh, explaining many of the computational processes. Computers are approaching the uh, computational power of the human brain, at least supercomputers right now. And the details of functionality and connectivity uh, within and between uh, various areas of the brain are emerging. Uh, for example, this is a circuit diagram of the visual area in the brain by Van Essen and some of his people. Uh, 12 layers, 32 areas. Each of these areas is an array of what I call co cortical computational units. So each of these uh, uh, areas is not just a single neuron or uh, just a random bunch of neurons, but these are arrays 
uh, of uh, cortical computational units. Uh, the, four, the lower areas of this are, are broken out in more detail and the functionality of the various uh, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 areas are uh, becoming uh, pretty well established. Uh, on, the, on this side you have large cells in the retina which drive uh, the so-called where channel that gives us a, a representation of space around us. These are high speed and they're very sensitive to motion. On the other side there's smaller cells which are much more higher resolution uh, which uh, give rise to the what channel that basically uh, go um, into the recognition of objects. They worry, uh, they, all the color information goes there. And these, uh, these on this side merge with the tactile sensors to give you a sense of space, both near term and far term. These on the left side uh, go into the temporal lobe where they merge with the acoustic, uh, so you get language uh, and associate sounds with, uh, with objects. So the long term is the detailed uh, circuitry and functionality of the CCU's arrays in the visual cortex are being understood. There's about a million CCU's in the human brain, about 200,000 in the uh, visual cortex, uh, and about 10,000 uh, neurons in each CCU. And the connectivity within and between the CCU's uh, are being mapped. Inputs and outputs are being discovered. Uh, this is a theoretical model come from some of my own work on the, uh, what a CCU might look like. First off, it's a uh, cortical hypercolumn with its underlying th uh, thalamical uh, and other uh, subcortical uh, units and the communication between them. Um, a set of uh, library of procedures that operate within this, uh, these, uh, this cortical hy hypercolumn and the output is basically, can be thought of as a, a large vector or a frame where you have attributes of the uh, pattern that is recognized by the uh, uh, CCU in terms of its range, its shape, its size, its texture, uh, its state in terms of orientation, velocity, uh, previous trace, and predicted behavior in the future. Then there are also pointers that point to what does this pattern belong to and what uh, parts of lower level CCUs make it up, and then a grouping criteria that uh, allows uh, the system to work. These are called driver uh, neurons that are coming out and going to higher level uh, uh, CCUs. Um, in the literature, these are called modulator neurons, which include inner neurons, in, uh, uh, which are m much more numerous, by the way, than the drivers. And these have the characteristics of addresses or pointers. Uh, and this whole unit, uh, the hypothesis is that this can do windowing, segmentation, grouping, uh, computation of group, group attributes, filtering, uh, classification, setting, and breaking relationship pointers. So it results in a grouping hierarchy where down at the bottom, actually below here, you have the, the retina. At V1, you detect edges and blobs. At V2, you begin to get surfaces and boundaries. Uh, V3 and higher, you get objects and groups of objects. And all these pointers be, uh, belongs to and link symbols to pixels and vice versa. So up here, we can figure out what pixels belong to this uh, group. And down below, we can see what pixels belong to that, uh, that group of objects. This provides symbol grounding, which has been a great mystery for decades. The theory is, is here, given the uh, the uh, connect connectivity that these pointers can be reset about every 50 milliseconds or about every saccade. So long-term potential is the functional modeling of the human brain at the level of CCUs appears to be within the capacity of current supercomputers. Done some back-of-the-envelope calculations there. Uh, and that human uh, level performance in perception, situation, uh, awareness, reasoning, planning, behavior might be feasible on desktop uh, class machines uh, within two decades. That would really change everything. So in summary, midterm solution to building uh, intelligence uh, systems, at least I believe, uh, lies in the uh, 4DRCS reference model or some uh, variation on it. Um, because this bridges the gap between the AI community and the modern control theory uh, people. Um, 
It's well documented, tested in a number of applications from uh, manufacturing, postal service, uh, postal uh, mail facilities, um, underwater vehicles, uh, nuclear uh, submarine uh, control, uh, to uh, uh, space telerobotics, and uh, in the last uh, 15 years uh, in the area of uh, unmanned ground vehicles. Uh, it's mature with many uh, software development tools. The long-term system, I really believe, uh, uh, lies in uh, reverse engineering uh, the, the brain um, because the neuroscience is brain imaging uh, enable visualization of brain activity during perception, thinking, planning, and acting. Um, testable models of computation and representation in the brain are emerging. Um, and functional modeling of the human brain seems within the capacity of uh, supercomputers today and perhaps uh, desktop computers within two decades, given, uh, given Moore's law holding for another two decades. So we're really at a tipping point analogous to where nuclear physics was in 1908. The uh, fundamental processes are uh, understood at least in principle of perception, world modeling, reasoning, planning, and control, and these neuroscience uh, things. Technology is emerging to conduct definitive uh, experiments, not just philosophical uh, uh, conversations. And significant military and economic applications will develop uh, undoubtedly early, early in this century. In fact, they're already developing. The impact on military strength will be profound. Um, intelligent weapon systems with human levels of capability will uh, outperform manned systems because they don't have to eat, sleep, uh, go to the bathroom. They cost less to train. Uh, you train uh, one or two and uh, you can download it with a CD to the others. Uh, cost less to maintain resident, uh, res readiness. You can put them in a box, put them on a ship out in the Indian Ocean, break them out and they're ready to go. Uh, and most of all, it keeps soldiers out of harm's way. Uh, so my feeling is that intelligent weapons uh, will revolutionize warfare in many, many ways. Thank you.